Good morning. All right. Where well, we are in Acts chapter 6, we've been going through this uh, verse by verse for, uh, for the last couple months. And uh, I don't want to complain, but it does seem like this week, chapter 6 only has 15 verses. And last week, I think Nathan had something like 40-some verses. And then I looked for next week, and it's going to be like 60-some verses. And I think there may be a conspiracy going on here. But we will try to make the most of the 15 verses. So I want to kind of review a little bit from, from chapter 5. Uh, again, that's the chapter where we have Ananias and Sapphira. Every, everyone's pretty well aware of that. It was kind of a shocking moment, obviously. As, um, and the story, you know, that they sold some property. And after they sold the property, they conspired together to say, yes, we sold this property and we're bringing all the funds from the sale of this property to the church. And then, you know, Peter says, says, you know, when you had this property, it was yours. You didn't have to sell it. And when you sold it, you didn't have, you could have kept some back. But instead, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And instantly he falls dead. When's the last time you saw someone fall dead in church? And then three hours later, his wife comes in. And they ask her, she's not aware of what happened, ask her the same questions, and then as a result of that, she falls down dead. And then Nathan was talking about how, kind of like in the Old Testament, where Uzzah reached out, you know, and he, and he touched the ark, which didn't seem like a, you know, a bad thing, just to keep it because of the oxen and the cart stumbled, and he instantly died. And I have another one I want to look at before we actually get to chapter 6, and that is in Leviticus chapter 10, and it's the story of Nahab and Abihu. Now, they were the sons of Aaron, okay? So we're just going to start with verse 1, go through 11. And it says, because this, this shows a precedent for this type of thing, okay, from the Old Testament. It said, Aaron's sons, Nahab and Abihu, took the censers and put in fire in them and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy in the sight of all people. I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and his pen, sons of Aaron's uncle, and said to them, Come here and carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them still in their tunics outside the camp, as Moses had ordered. And then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Do not let your hair become unkept, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with you and the whole community. But your relatives and all the house of Israel may mourn, for the Lord has, has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting, or you will die because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. And so they did as Moses said. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and all your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drinks whenever you go into the tent of meeting, or you will die. This is a lasting ordinance from generations to come. You must distinguish between the holy and common between the unclean and the clean, and you must teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. So we look at that, and we say, well, okay, what does that have to do with us today? 
Well, there is a spiritual principle, and that is what you get away with in the outer courts can get you killed in the Holy of Holies. In other words, right now, no one churches is falling, being struck dead by, by the Lord. But in that day, if we get what we are praying for, a revival where the presence of the Lord is manifest among us, where signs and wonders are happening in our midst, then you need to be very careful how you walk. So again, that spiritual principle of what you get away with in the outer courts can get you killed in the Holy of Holies. All right, so Acts chapter 6. And we're going to just go kind of, for the most part, kind of verse by verse. Take our time, go through it. Verse 1. In these days, when the number of disciples were increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So when a church is, is growing by not only addition, by multiplication, that causes problems. Because just like everyone has a nose, everyone has an opinion, right? So the more people you have, the more opinion you have. Music's not loud enough, the music's too loud. It's too cold, it's too hot in here. I don't like the carpet. Yeah, sorry about that, but not that much carpet here. But So these, these legitimate complaints are, and some of your versions will say they murmured, and there are some that are illegitimate, okay? And in this case, they really did have a legitimate complaint. Because what was happening was that the Grecians, and some of you, your versions may say Hellenistic, which means Greek-speaking. So these were the Greek-speaking uh, Jews who have become Christians. And the, the Hebrew-speaking Jews, they kind of looked down on the Grecian Jews as kind of a little less than, kind of felt like, yeah, they're, they're kind of compromised a little bit because they compromised with the, uh, the culture, uh, which had come about basically because clear back many centuries before when Alexander the Great conquered the entire world in six years, we not only conquered it, but he also brought Grecian culture, okay? And Greek became the, the known language at the time. While the Hebrews obviously spoke Hebrew and also Aramaic. And so there were some differences. It, it's like today, if we were to look at it, there, there are many different sects of Judaism. Just like today in Christianity, look at all the different denominations there are, hundreds of them. So it was the same way back then. And so they had a, a, a really uh, a legitimate uh, complaint. So the... And I want you to think about this, too, because we're talking about the widows, okay? Back in that day, there was no safety net. There was no uh, government program. So when a, a widow lost her husband, and that was the only source of income the person had, then they were left pretty much destitute. So the church would take care of those and that's why they had the, the daily feeding of those widows. And this not only happened in, the, in, the, you know, in Jerusalem, but really throughout the New Testament as we go. Because we're going to see, in fact, I want us to look over at 1 Timothy. Paul was dealing with this issue also in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And as he's uh, speaking to... Uh, to Timothy about how to properly hold this stuff. How do you give guidelines? So we're going to look at verses 3 to 10. 
And he says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own families and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. Now the widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and voting herself to all kinds of good deeds. So Paul is giving kind of instructions. So this was something that was going on not only in the Jerusalem church, but as time went on, they had to be a way to help provide for those who were actually destitute without help. So, and again, this was, you know, this was an issue going on and, it, and actually was a, a problem and there was an actual little complaint that had justification. So let's look at verses 2 through 4. And it says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among yourselves who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So we kind of also need to think about, you know, rather than bringing a problem, we also need to think about how we bring a solution. Okay? So, and I want you to understand, too, that for the apostles or the disciples, the 12, who were busy pretty well full-time in prayer and ministering the Word, that that does not mean that the serving tables was any less than. Because sometimes what we think of is holy, and this is righteous, is not the same standard that God has. So whether I'm up here teaching or whether I'm on one of the cleaning teams and cleaning the bathrooms, it's all the same. In the Lord's eyes. But we always try to evaluate some things as more spiritual than others. Now we also have a precedent for this in the Old Testament again. So if we go to Exodus chapter 18, flip over back there, we have a situation that Moses ran into. Exodus chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse 13, and it says, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. Now when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone set as judge why all the people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and his laws. 
Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourself out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must see the people's representatives before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and the law and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and ten. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands it, you will be able to stand the strain, and all the people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he did. He chose capable men from Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and ten. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases were brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. So you can imagine about three million people, and he's the lone dis- decider or judge of all the people who have a complaint against someone else. And so it also did not allow him time to teach the Torah to the people so they would understand what the laws are. So it was a case of delegating. So he says, you choose seven men full of the spirit and wisdom and I'd also say fruit, uh, full of the fruits of the Spirit. Because it was too heavy a burden for the disciples to handle that and do what they were called to do. Now, verse 5, going back to Acts 6 again. So this proposal pleased the whole group. Now they chose Stephen, a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicodor, Timoth, Parmes, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So they choose these five or these seven different men, and the only ones we know more about, at least in the Bible, is, of course, Stephen and Philip. The rest of them we don't know too much about, except it's interesting that that Nicholas is a Gentile uh, from Antioch. He was was converted to Judaism. Now, there are some scholars who say that this Nicholas, and we can't say this for sure, but that he may have uh, got off, shipwrecked his faith, and started what was in Revelation chapter 2, where it talks about the Nicolaitans. But we don't know that for sure. So I don't want to, you know, in case I get to heaven and see him one day and say, that wasn't me. And I say, oh, sorry about that, buddy. <clears throat> so in verse 6, it says, They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now, usually when we do it, we lay hands on people and we pray. But it's interesting to me that they prayed and then they laid hands on them. In other words, okay, these are the seven that were presented to us. Are these the ones, Lord, that you want? So let's see if the Holy Spirit would uh, confirm to them, yes, these are the seven. Now, and also that process of laying on of hands, I want to read a couple of scriptures, one out of 1 Timothy, 
1 Timothy chapter 5. And verse 22, it says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. In other words, this is especially talking about as you're setting people in office or you're in a responsibility, do not be hasty. And in another place it says, uh, do not Lay high, well, do not appoint someone who is a new believer because you want to see if they have the character to actually carry what you're calling them to do. And so do not be hasty just because someone seems to have talent or and a, a charisma about immediately setting them into a certain office, Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this kind of applies. And verse 1 through 8. It says, If any of you have a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have a dispute about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is no one among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The fact that you have lawsuits among you mean that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourself cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. So obviously we have the same situation occurring in the church where there are believers who are actually taking other believers uh, and suing them in civil court or criminal courts. Uh, and so Paul was a manager to them, just like, don't you have people wise enough to judge within the church to when there is a disagreement that comes up. I had that privilege of doing that one time. And it's not fun. Uh, it wasn't in this church. It was another church. And had two brothers, which loved both of them. Went in business together. And they had a very strong disagreement. And it ended up, uh, I was glad that they did eventually come to me before they got to that place of suing one another. And uh, I had the opportunity, and actually I read this scripture before I did. Uh, and while it was a hard thing to do, because you're just going on the information you know, and you just pray about it and, and, and pray that it is the right judgment that you make. And, uh, and so... While it was hard, it was something that, that needed to be done and was done right. So anyway, things like that will pop up. And we don't you like to talk about things like that, but we, we need to be aware, yes, people have different opinions. People have strong uh, opinions. That different things have different ways they think that things should be done. And when it comes to that point, we need to have believers who are full of Holy Spirit, to can do the same thing as, as they did back in, in Acts, where they can make judgments without someone having to go and take, go to law or go to the civil authorities. 
I also might mention, you know, I told you that, that the only two that are mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, of course, are Stephen and then Philip, uh, which is called, he's called the evangelist in um, Acts 21. And it says, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So, all right, so verse 7, back to Acts. If you notice, you probably spend more time out of Acts than you do in Acts. All right. All right. So verse 7. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So the church is growing again. It's multiplying and it says a large number of priests. This is something I, I really didn't know before, but it actually says there were a, a thousand priests. So we usually think about the high level, lower, these are lower ranked priests, and most of them were actually poor. Because we think about the Sadducees and the, the ones of the Sanhedrin, but there's a whole other class below that that were priests, and a lot of them were very sincere. Uh, and actually wanting to do the right thing, and they were converted to Christianity. So verse 8, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miracle signs among the people. So while Stephen wasn't one of the apostles, he did great signs and wonders, which tells you that all of us, the body of Christ as a whole, you don't need a title. You just need to carry the presence of the Lord wherever you're going and be willing to be used as Stephen was. Verse 9, opposition arose. How many times have we seen that? Okay, so the gospel is going forth, you know, ground is being gained, and then opposition comes. So it's the same pattern you find all the way through Acts. Gospel goes forth, there's a counterattack. The enemy doesn't like what's happening. So opposition arose, however, and, and from members of the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Sicilia and Asia. Now these men began to argue with Stephen. Okay, so they began to argue with him. In verse 11, but they could not stand up against the wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. So remember that what Jesus told the disciples, he said, you know, you're going to be carried, you're going to be brought before the officials, you're going to be brought before kings, you're going to be arrested. And he says, don't worry about what you are to say. He says, the Lord will give you what you need to say. So in this case, Stephen was given full of the Holy Spirit. He was able to, to confound them where they couldn't really have anything that they could come against Stephen with. So what did they do in verse 11? Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they had to get false witnesses to come to try to bring some type of charge against Stephen. Okay, we'll look at 12 through 14. So they, they stirred, stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. And they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin is made of 70 plus the high priest. They proclaimed, they produced false witnesses who testified this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For they had heard him say 
that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Okay, so there's, there's two different charges. One is that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Number two is, and he's going to change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Okay, so those are the two, the two charges. So we're going to kind of take one at a time. So the first charge, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Now, there's two different applications here. One, you go to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 2. Turn there real quickly. John, chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. I'll go actually start with 18. It says, Then Jesus, oh, no, I'm sorry. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will, dis- I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, I have taken, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he was spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled what he said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus has spoken. So he first talks about his own body, okay, being the temple of the Lord. But... This made me kind of go on a, a little different segue because I thought he's applying, Jesus is applying that, that he's a temple, okay? But he also says in the New Testament that we are the temple. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, I want to look at a couple verses there just so you can see it. 1 Corinthians 3.16 is one. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, he says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? First Corinthians, oh, chapter 6, verse 10, yeah. Well, obviously, I have it written down. But he also says in there that, don't you know, again, that you are the temple of the living God? What is it? Oh. Okay. So, I think sometimes if we would realize that, that we actually are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That some, maybe some of our actions, some of the things we allow ourselves to watch, uh, situations that we put ourselves in, if we would really be, be thinking about, hey, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm a temple of the Lord. Should I be putting myself and putting the Lord with me in that situation? Should I be watching this particular thing with that knowledge that I am the temple of the living God? I think it might change our actions and change to some degree the way we live so that we need to remind ourselves that we are a living temple and that won't that what we're doing, we're putting ourselves, we're bringing with us the Lord in that situation. Would the Lord be happy with us in doing what we are doing at that time? 
All right, so I'm going back to destroy this temple. I'm going to take an, now a different look, because like I said, there's two different applications. So I'm going to go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Because in reality, Jesus could say, yes, I'm guilty. What you just accused me of, that's true. Because he gives a parable of attendance in chapter 12 of Mark. And this is a parable, you know, sometimes some of the parables that Jesus gives are a little hard to understand. You, you know, what's, the, what's the true interpretation of it? Sometimes people had to ask, what does he speak in parables? And, you know, and he says, so those who really have hunger will seek and find, while others will blow it off. But in this parable... It's pretty clear. And we find out that the, that the uh, disciples, or the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew exactly what he was saying. Okay, so Mark chapter 12, verse 1. And this is Jesus. He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard out to some farmers and went away on a journey. Now at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyards. That would be the, the prophets throughout the Old Testament. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them, and they struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. Again, that's just a history of the Old Testament, right, with Israel. He had one left to send, a son. I wonder who that would be. Last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. And the vineyard has always been one of the... Uh, uh, pictures of Israel. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill these tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against him, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. So they knew that he had spoken this parable about them. It was directly to the leaders of Israel, the religious leaders. And if you look over chapter 13, just the first two verses, and it says, as he was leaving the temple... One of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massy stones, what magnificent buildings. Because that at the time was one of the seven wonders of the world. This huge temple complex that took 46 years to build. And Jesus said, Do you see these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And that's what exactly happened in 70 AD as the Romans came in, destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left on top of the other. The temple was burnt. Judgment came. Now, that was about probably between at least 35 to 38 years later. So Jesus speaks the word, it didn't come immediately. But it came, and judgment came.
came upon the nation of Israel, and they say that over a million Jews were killed because they'd had all gathered for the feast, and they were all inside. But uh, Josephus tells us that the Christians fled Jerusalem. As they saw the armies gathering around, that the Christians fled, remembering Jesus' words and warning. Also, um, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go to the number two, which was, and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. So in, in the Jewish system, we'll call this a system because there are 613 laws, okay, set up throughout the Torah. And this system, as the New Testament tells us, no one was ever saved through following the road, the, all these different laws because no one could follow all the laws. And so in John chapter 1, I'm going to read just a couple of scriptures. John 1, 17 and 18. It says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we have these 600 and some laws, 613, and then Matthew chapter 7 Again, this is Jesus speaking, verse 12. So in everything you do, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So this sums up the Torah and the prophets. In other words, we can boil those 613 different laws down and say that that in everything you do, if you treat others, what we call the golden rule, as you would want to be treated, you're fulfilling the law. And then in chapter 22, he gives another basic saying, something very similar. Because in, in verse 34, when hearing this, Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commands. So all the law and the prophets hang on those two commands. Loving the Lord your God with all your might, all your strength. And loving your neighbor as yourself. And also throughout those 613 laws, where a lot of them had to do with blood sacrifices, okay? That for certain things, you had bulls that you would kill, or you would have lambs, or you didn't have turtle doves. You'd have different sacrificial system that was going on to shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins, okay? But in 1 Corinthians 5.7, it says that for Christ is our Passover Lamb, and he has been sacrificed. So for one time forever, for our past sins, our, our present sins, and even for our future sins, he has paid the price. So we no longer, obviously, have to have a, a temple and have to have sacrificial uh, animals sacrificed again. And on that point, I'd like to say that I think there is some 
Um, people who have a, you know, a good heart, but they, because I know, I know some Christians who have supported giving money to building a third temple in Jerusalem. And, of course, the, the plans of the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox would be that they want to establish, again, the sacrificial system. But I think that would be a, uh, a stench in God's nostril because it's been paid for by Christ, the sacrificial lamb. All right, verse 15. Our last. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin, they looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So it's almost like they looked at him, and he was like Moses. You know, when Moses came down from the... uh, from the mountain, being with the Lord, that he had to cover his face because his face shone. And like on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus' face shone because the glory of the Lord was upon him. And in this case, I believe that's what was going on with Stephen. And he wasn't angry. He wasn't um, vengeful. But his face shone with the presence of of the Lord, and it was noticeable by them. So instead of gnashing their teeth like those who were accusing him, he was at peace, and his face shone, and the presence of God was upon him. So that's Acts chapter 6. Now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit, because as we think about this, What happened to Israel, where we had the the parable of the tenants, where there was a warning, you know, and and I hear so many today even say, you know, that without revival, we're on that same path as a nation, because we have left, and because of all that's happening across the world today, and all the the negative things, the darkness that seems to be increasing. There's a lot of talk, a lot of chatter right now about end times. What's coming? What's coming our way? And in one way, I think that's good because it makes us aware. But I think it can also be a little bit of a distraction in that if we put too much emphasis on that, You know, our little sign out there says, you know, our mission statement is knowing God and making him known. In other words, growing in our own, uh, in our own individual faith, in our intimacy with the Lord, and then making him known to others. That's, That's our job description. And so we don't want to get too distracted by what's going on. You know, over the years, uh, I remember when I was uh, fairly new in the faith and back clear back in the 70s, there was a book came out. It was titled uh, Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. <clears throat> and so I read it, thought it was you know, popular, and I just thought, okay, that's the way it is. Before things get real bad, we're going to be raptured out of here. But then as I began to grow in faith and began to study, I definitely changed my views. Now, we can all have different views, but my, def- my view is definitely, I, don't, I do not believe in a, a, pre, a, rap, a pre-trib rapture. I don't think we're going to be, um, I'm, not, I'm not looking for an escape, you might say. I believe in the rapture, but I believe it happens when Christ returns that we meet him in the air and come with him. So I, I, you know, I'm watching what's going on in the world, and, you know, there's a lot of threats right now about World War III, and perhaps we are maybe already in it, 
in the stage of a proxy war, and that could develop. There's also economic issues going on in the country that even though the economy seems to be, you know, the good news, there's a lot of underlying thing with debt, the national debt and other things, and our currency. There are facts like the FBI came out what, this, this last week and said that China has hacked into all our utilities. You know, they can shut off electricity, they can shut off your water, your sewer, all that stuff. And so we need to be aware, and for those who, I, I would just suggest you pray. You know, God may have you do some things to prepare for times that may be changing, some hard times. But our faith needs to be in the Lord. And I think sometimes people can get so distracted in preparation, and I've taught preparation for years. But at the same time, I saw that people get off course in that they're so making sure all their lists are covered, and you can't cover everything. There's, a, there's holes in all of those, you know, no matter how prepared you think you are. And while I think there's wisdom in that, because Proverbs says, you know, a man sees trouble coming, he prepares for it. But I think we can't get distracted from the main thing, keeping the main thing the main thing. And that's our life, because we are all going to die unless the Lord comes back before that time. So the things that are important is things that last for eternity. So I just want to kind of encourage you this morning to, regardless of the things we may be seeing and the, the darkness, again, it is increasing. Times are not going to get easier. Times are going to get harder. But I think it's in the midst of that darkness where the Lord releases his spirit and his power. And so rather than having a, oh no, it's an anticipation of it's for such a time as this that you've been born, that you are alive at this time in history. So regardless of what happens, we're going to let our light shine brightly. And so just be aware, be listening, but don't get too distracted about events that are happening. Because the Lord says, hey, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And as we're going to find out with Stephen next week, what happened? Did the Lord deliver him? No. He was the first martyr of the church. I can't guarantee any of us are going to live or die or whether we'd be martyr or whether persecution comes. We just need to have, again, the main thing, the main thing, and keep our focus upon the Lord and what he wants to do, what he's doing. And, and let things happen as they happen. Just keep our eyes and our focus upon the Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Acts. That, Lord, you showed what the New Testament church is supposed to look like how it functioned, how it grew, the problems that happen, the issues that come up. And it gives us insight as how we are to be a New Testament church. So, Lord, we just continue to pray and ask you, Lord, for your presence, your power. Lord, we ask for that increase of your anointing and increase of the gifts of the Spirit and increase of your authority. That, Lord, we might be carriers of your presence. Lord, we want to know you more. And we want to make you known. So, Lord, help us, Lord. Prepare us to be a people set apart for you to do your will. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.